I want to say the first thing. Uh, I've had a chance with a team that I've worked with uh, a couple occasions in the last month uh, to uh, express my gratitude to them. And, but this will be my only chance really to say to you, thank you. From our heart, thank you. Over these years, your patience, your forgiveness, your love, your understanding, your trust, your generosity, your confidence. I could go on and on. I have been, we have been, so honored and so blessed to have served here any years, much less 40 years. And to rub shoulders with people like you. And our lives are richer, better, and our walk with Christ stronger. For many reasons. But you, the people of God at First Orlando, have had a great deal to do with that over these years. And from our heart, words are inadequate to say, thank you, thank you. I want you to see how things change. You could probably throw some pictures up here as well. But back in June 3rd, 1980, that's me, our oldest and only girl, Stephanie, our oldest son, Jeremy, and uh, Linda, who hasn't changed a bit uh, over the uh, years. This picture was, was uh, taken on the platform downtown on our first Sunday here, June 3rd in 1980. June 3rd of 1980. Unbelievable. Now, here's today, or at least close to today. This was taken about a year ago at the uh, celebration service for Linda's mom, who uh, uh, had a great walk with Christ for almost 105 years and impact on our journey. And this is our, our, uh, uh, our family. And uh, we came here with two children, and God gave us two more. And now we have three uh, grandchildren and one on the way in a few weeks. And uh, we've been through so many things. Uh, as David said, uh, it's been the best of times, been the worst of times. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, had the kids and the grandkids. Uh, I think one of the high points, David, I know uh, that you and the rest of the staff team, every time somebody gets baptized, okay, we feel like we earned our paycheck. Because, folks, it's about reaching people for Jesus and about seeing them uh, have life change and getting, uh, getting baptized like we did this morning. And I rolled over on that ramp wall back in 2014. Uh, I think it was like 32,359 people had gotten baptized in the years that I had been here then, six years ago. So now that number, who knows, may have approached 35,000 people. And that is a testament, not, not so much to the leadership, but to you. We're not out there with the people you are. You're the one who invite them to come to be a part of this experience. And we're grateful for that and we recognize that. So what do you, what do you, what do you teach on when you've, uh, when you've been teaching for 40 years, somewhere around 800 sermons, thousands of, I guess you could say, classes and Bible studies? What, where, do, where do you go? What, what, what do you say when you kind of have one final shot uh, at, uh, at the people that, that you love. And I prayed over it uh, really for a number of weeks and I just felt like the Lord kept coming to me and, and, and He kept saying to me the same thing that you've always said, the same practice that you've always had. Keep saying the same thing to them because they still need to hear it and you still need to practice it as they need to practice it. So I ended up going back. You've seen this before. This is not for many of you new. Uh, uh, years ago, God got me really laser focused in, uh, in what he wanted me to be and what he wanted me to do with life and ministry. And I created uh, uh, a kind of a life uh, ministry, life purpose statement that goes like this. Overall, to serve others. You know, I just want to, I just want to be available to help and to serve others and to add value to them by igniting their growth, by igniting their growth. Using, when God calls you to do something, He always gives you the resources to do it. Using my God-given resources of teaching and leading and exhorting or encouraging and pursuing it. But you can do that, but while you pursue the purpose, you got to act right. you got to do right, okay? And for me, my core values are truth, integrity, excellence, responsibility, and it's all to and for the glory of of God. But there are two words here, igniting growth. Igniting growth. Uh, 
That's been my, my passion for me and for you. And part of that is because of my story. Uh, I grew up in, a, uh, uh, in an unbelieving home. Uh, both my parents were, uh, were, uh, were alcoholics and spiritual things were of no interest to them whatsoever. But at 10 year old, as a 10 year old, I got invited by a friend to go to vacation Bible school in a small town in northwest Tennessee. And there I made my first choice to follow Christ. About three or four years later, I was uh, playing football, and my high school coach uh, took the team that wanted to go a few miles away to a fellowship of Christian athletes camp uh, for the weekend where we heard more about spiritual things, and I made a second decision to follow Christ. And I didn't do a lot of following, to be honest with you, during those teenage years. It just wasn't a part of my experience. And then at age 22, we had a tragedy in our, in our family. My brother and, uh, lost a, a baby at crib death, and that just rocked my world. And so I met with Linda's pastor, who was blind from diabetes, and knelt by his couch in his, uh, in his living room and trusted Christ again, again. And uh, then, and less than a, than a, than a year later, uh, I made another decision for Christ. So uh, come and you say, well, Jimmy, when did you get saved? Well, I'm not sure which one. I'm saved. Trust me, I am saved, okay? But one of those stuck, you know, uh, back there uh, in my journey. Uh, I'm not really sure whether it was 10 or 13, 14, or whether it was in, in, in this year's, but what was missing in all those that, that here in this 22, 23-year-old experience that changed the trajectory of my journey with Christ well before God called me into vocational ministry. And that was something, I made a choice in this 22, 23-year-old season, almost 50 years ago, that I didn't make back here at 10 or at 13 to 14. And that was the choice. Just like I had to decide if I wanted to follow Jesus I also had to decide here. I had to choose. Am I going to grow? Am I going to develop? Am I going to become all that God wants me to be as far as it depends on me? So I made a decision that I'm going to grow. I'm going to develop. I'm going to move along in my journey. And I don't think a lot of believers ever come to that specific decision. So if you got your Bibles, I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I want to speak to you for a few minutes on the subject to keep on climbing. Keep on climbing. Don't pause, don't stop, no matter how slow it gets, keep on climbing. There's a story uh, uh, in the Alps of a, of a, of a, uh, of a well-known guide well-respected guide that heard that there were some climbers that were in trouble, and he made his way to help rescue them, but he perished in the process. And there's a monument there in the Swiss Alps honoring him with these words, he died climbing. He died climbing. And that's what I want for you, and that's what I want for me. Open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, and let me, <clears throat> let me read these verses here because it sets the backdrop for what I want to talk about this morning and, and challenge you and me with. He died climbing. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His very uh, precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's significant that Peter, who came to, uh, uh, was called by Christ and followed him and struggled in his journey, I think, to grow and develop. 
uh, that I feel so much kinship with in my own journey that he wrote these words. And he kind of lays out uh, the plan of how you and I can continue to climb and grow in our journey. And it, has, it really has little to do with chronological age. Let me, let me, sh- let me show you a graph. Let me show you a chart here. Uh, here's the growth uh, 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 vertical axis. And on the bottom is just the passing of time. And here is birth. Here is birth. This is one of the things to show you is proven uh, research and data about the, our physical chronological life. What's this? Uh, it's a curve here, and somewhere around uh, teenage, late teenage years, early twenties, we all kind of we all kind of flatten out. Okay, you don't run into people, uh, you know, that are still uh, growing chronologic, physically in stature, you know, uh, past their mid twenties. It, it'd be very rare. But if we were parents and we had uh, children here and they weren't, uh, uh, you know, uh, growing as they should have been growing, okay, we would take them to our pediatrician and, and, and see what the deal was. But this, this is an automatic. You, you eat, right? You sleep, right? You exercise. This is just going to happen. It's the normal pattern of the physical life. And there's really, if we're normal, not, not anything that's going to change. But what about the spiritual journey? This is a little bit more anecdotal, but I have watched it over 40 years here plus years coming here. This yellow line is, I call it the, uh, unfortunately, the normal, normal, too normal Christian experience. And it is back here, there's a spiritual birth. At some point, put faith and trust in Christ. And then the journey began, and as time passed, there were high seasons and low seasons, high seasons and low seasons. But yet, it was pretty much flat all the way across in terms of uh, progression. Pretty much stayed the same. The highs stay the same, the lows stay the same. And I I observed that being, at least anecdotally, the normal Christian life of too many folks, but I don't believe it's the life that God intended. I really don't believe it is. I believe this next line is is the life that He intends for us. And that is this red line where you and I come to faith in Christ and we grow. It's almost always true after someone comes to Christ. There's the exuberance of the new uh, relationship with God through Christ and we grow. But then there is a, there tends to be a flattening of season and then we may project again and then we may go down and then we take off again and then we go down. What I want you to notice, there's still highs and lows in the journey, but notice over time, notice what's happening here. There is, there is, a, there is a, a steady uh, incline, as it were, that's taking place here as you continue to climb and to ascend uh, in your relationship with Christ. We're even to the point back here where you had a spiritual uh, a high and here you're at a spiritual low. The spiritual low is higher than the high you had before. You, does that make sense to you? I think this is the normal. We're never going to have a life in Christ that way. I don't think that was God's plan. He knows our fallenness and humanness and struggles, especially in a sinful world. So what we're after is this. And I think Peter in these verses gives us some insight into how we keep climbing in our relationship and our walk with the Lord. And there are two parts, two very, very important parts in the journey. First, God has a part. Uh, in, in what's happening in our journey. And we'll talk about what his part is and what he supplies to us and for us. And then ours, uh, we, we have a part. You have a part. I have a part. It's a choice that we make, just like we did initially in coming to Christ. It is a choice we make whether or not to obey and to grow and to learn and to become more and more like him. And this is the process, you might say, that Peter suggests, and I believe works, to help you and I get on a steady incline in our growth in Christ. And what's important to see is these, there's a synergy here. They work together. There's a corporate venture between what God is doing, has done, and is doing, and what I need to be doing on a regular basis in my journey. And these have got to work together for us to continue, as it were, to ascend and to climb the mountain. So let's look at each one of these and, and uh, over the next few minutes. First, let's look at God's part. What is God's part? And if you op- look in these opening verses that I read a few minutes ago, God has a very important part in helping us to move on and to grow in our journey. Notice what he says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Christ Jesus, of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained or have received uh, b- by faith through grace, a faith of equal standing with who? With ours. Who is ours? The apostles by the righteousness of God and of Jesus Christ. God's part is supplying equal salvation. What do I mean by equal salvation? Peter was one of the original followers of Christ, one of the apostles, as was, as was James, as were the other original 12. 
But how did they get into the kingdom? How did they experience a salvation? Is it any different than what you and I experienced thousands of years later? No, it isn't. Is their salvation of greater honor, greater value, greater blessing because they were original apostles and disciples and we are not? Absolutely not. God has supplied an equal salvation to every one of us in the room. Equal in honor, standing in blessing that even Peter himself experienced as a follower of Christ. What a, what a resource. And then next, we have abundant graces. Abundant graces. Notice what he says in verse 2. May grace, which is kind of the root of Christian graces, and peace, it's the, uh, kind of the fruit of it, you might say, not be added, but be multiplied to you. How? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He provides to us all of the graces that we need to live out the life that he has for us. Next, and a big one, divine power. We can't do this thing on our own. We just simply cannot make it on our own. But he has supplied divine power. Notice what he says in verse 3. His divine power has granted, and the idea there is freely of grace. We didn't earn it or deserve it. To us, not most things, not some things, not just when we need it, all things, all things, all things. What do you need? All things he supplies that pertain to what? To life. The word there is zoe. It means uh, spiritual life. It's referring, I think, to the event of salvation and coming to Christ. God has supplied all that you and I need in the person and the work of his son to come into a relationship with God through his son. That's spiritual life. But he didn't stop there. And godliness also supplied what you and I need to live out that life that he has in, uh, that he has put in a uh, place in us in the person and in the work of the Holy Spirit. That's a powerful resource that you and I have together. His divine power has given us everything you need to enter the Christian life and to and to live the Christian life again through the knowledge of Him who called us into His own glory and exit. But that's not all. But He has freely granted to us His very precious, His very precious and great promises. I've never counted them. I've read that there are about 7,500 promises in the Bible. 7,500. 7,500. But Peter mentions two here. But they are enormous in terms of the context of the message. Notice what he says. He has granted to us these precious and very great promises so that through them, and he mentions two, we become partakers of the divine nature. I think that is a reference to the, to the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the moment that you and I trust Christ, experience this equal salvation. God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit comes into us, permanently dwells, uh, indwells us. And we don't just get some of him, we get all of him because he is a person. The issue of the empowerment and the enablement in your journey and my journey to grow and to ascend the mountain doesn't depend just on our ability. It depends on our willingness to surrender all that we are and have to the indwelling Holy Spirit in our person. And they've got to work together and God has supplied that. And in the supplying of that, notice what he says, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. What's he saying? Though I have supplied all of these resources, and maybe the greatest one being myself living in you, it's still not going to be easy to live for me. You're still strapped in, uh, with the fallenness that you were born with. You're still going to make bad choices and decisions. You're still going to struggle in your journey to become like me. And it's especially easy for those struggles to take place and for us to make wrong decisions when we live in a sinful and corrupt society. It's easy. It's easier to be tempted, and then to fall into sin. This is what God has provided. I don't know, since he says he's given us all things, I don't know that we need any more in terms of what he has supplied. So maybe the issue is less about what God has supplied and more about what we do with what God has supplied. And that moves us into the, as it were, into the next part. And our part is to obey, to, uh, uh, to, to apply these resources uh, of salvation and promises that I just read. Notice what uh, Peter said. For this reason. What reason? Because God has done his part. Because has supplied, God has supplied all of the resources that we need for life and for godliness. God has done his part. Make every effort. Give it all you got. Put forth every ounce of your being. Don't hold back. Jump all in. Fully surrender. Do your best to fully obey. 
Be diligent in your journey. Pay attention to your journey. All of those would be sent and answer what he's saying here. Here is your responsibility, Jimmy. Here is your people's responsibility, Jimmy, to grow and to climb the mountain. They have to make every effort to do what? To supplement, to add, to augment, to grow, to develop, to climb in their faith. Faith, I think, referring to the initial saving faith to come into a relationship with Christ. I think it was Emmy Dodd. David, you remember that name, Emmy Dodd? It said that uh, uh, conversion is 5% of the Christian life. 95% is going on. And, and, and it is. And it is. So, what does, what, is, what does this effort look like? How do we and with what do we supplement our faith or continue to climb the mountain of growth? Well, I want you to see, here's a... Here's a graphic that will, you know, help uh, make it come alive to keep on climbing. Here's this mountain. We want to ascend this mountain, and we want to ascend this mountain all the way up to the top as far as we can possibly go in this life, knowing that ultimately we probably not will, eat, we will not reach perfection in Christ's likeness in this life, uh, but not until the next. That doesn't mean we don't, we don't, we don't uh, uh, give our best effort to do that and make every effort. So let's go back to the base, and the base is faith. Most of you, if not all of you, have established the base. Now Peter says, okay, let's climb. Let's grow. Let's become all that God wants us to be in our journey, however long that journey may be today. And he mentions these seven supplements, additives, spiritual qualities that every one of us must add. I think there's a sense that's, that, that, that they're se sequential or progressive and in one sense, but they're also overlapping in, a, in, a, in another sense. I do think one leads to another, but yet there's some overlapping going here between all seven. And what I'm hoping that you'll do as I walk through these in these next few verses, that you'll be looking, is there, is there some quality, something in here that I'm really not giving enough attention to, not paying enough, not working hard enough, not being diligent enough, that I maybe have neglected, and I'm not giving it all that I've got. Because my final challenge to you and me is that we keep on climbing. All right? So let's look at it. First, uh, supplement your faith with virtue. With virtue. Uh, 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 the word virtue here, the Greek word means the proper fulfillment of something. Uh, like uh, 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 if I were to hand you a knife and ask you, what, what's the best thing that knife could do? Okay, uh, cut, slice. That's, what, that's the proper fulfillment of why a knife was created. What if I handed you a pair of scissors? Okay, what would you do? Well, you would cut paper. Well, you would use it to cut. Okay, if I were to hand you a device, your phone, to communicate, what's the best thing it could do? Communicate, communicate, communicate. If I were to ask you, once you're in the faith, once you've trusted Christ, once you've come to a relationship with Him, what is the best thing you can do? My answer to that would be the proper fulfillment of something that would, well, spend the rest of my life becoming as much like him as I can in my attitudes and my beliefs and my behaviors. That would be my aim. That would be my goal, to be more and more and more like Jesus. That would be my aim. And that's exactly what Peter is saying here. Once you establish this foundation of faith, the next thing you have to choose, you have to decide, am I going to be the best possible follower of Christ that I can be no matter what anybody else does and no matter what comes into my life? And I think that's a conscious choice we make that most of us never make. We just kind of float. Something happened in my journey, not at 10, not at 12 and 13, but at 22, 23, that was a wake-up call for me. Hey, Jim, you got to make a choice. You're going to be serious about this thing? You're going to grow? This is well before any call to vocational ministry. Let me repeat myself. And I think it's a decision that every one of us hopefully will choose to make and to make every effort in doing that. So become as much like Christ as possible. It's the commitment to climb the mountain Every mountain climber, the first thing out of the box, you've got to say, you know what, I'm going to climb that sucker, and I'm going to get to the top, and I'm going to defeat it. So, supplement your faith with virtue. Supplement your virtue with knowledge. Why do you need knowledge? If you don't know what to do or where to go, you get on a horse and you ride off in all directions and accomplish nothing. Knowledge, knowledge of what to do, 
What, to be, what does it mean to become like Christ? What does that mean? What does that look like? We need the knowledge of knowing where we need to invest our commitment. And where do we get that knowledge? In fact, it's interesting. Peter repeats knowledge three or four times in this passage, all the way back uh, into verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge, in the knowledge of our uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he talks about he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Where do we find that? Through the knowledge of him who has called us knowledge. And this is more than biblical, uh, biblical uh, uh, information and facts. Uh, it, it certainly would include some of that, but I think what's, what's equally, if not more important than the biblical information that you and I learn, it's what we do with it. It's the uh, application of it in our journey. It's taking that which, I'm not sure that, that obedience is, compl- uh, that knowledge is complete and we take, until we take that which we have learned and we live it. So you might could say you add this commitment to doing what you know you need to do. You got to learn what you know you need to do, but then you have to live it out. It's a it's a practical uh, living out of the Christian experience, not just the knowledge. I've been around long enough, and some of you could shake your heads on this. I know a lot of people have got a lot of Bible knowledge; they just got a gap, a lot of gaps in their living. So I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not minimizing the importance of knowing the Bible. I'm emphasizing the importance of living it. That takes far precedence over knowledge of Scripture. So, if you want to climb the mountain, you've got to establish the base. You've got to add a commitment to be like Christ, the knowledge to know what that looks like. And then next is self-control, self-control, discipline, okay? Uh, uh, Obedience uh, over the long long, uh, course. And that takes self-control because it's not easy. We still struggle with sin. We still live in a fallen world. We still have corrupted desires. And we're going to struggle to make the right choices. We're going to struggle to have the right attitudes. We're going to struggle to have the right behaviors and actions in our journey. And it's going to take a lot of self-control. And remember, we're partakers of the divine nature. So we got the Holy Spirit there working in us to help us practice self, maybe even better said, spirit control to walk in obedience to that which we know and have learned. But he's not done. Add to your faith, virtue, commitment to be like Christ. Not only what does that look like, self-control to live it out on a regular basis, steadfastness. That would be perseverance. Uh, that would be stick to Why? Because you're going to run into some obstacles. There are going to be some bumps in the road. There are going to be some hurdles along the way. There are going to be some disappointments in the journey. There are going to be uh, some tragedies in the journey. Life is not going to always work out the way you and I want it to work out. And we're going to wonder where, what happened to God and where is he when I really need him. And that's when we need steadfastness, perseverance, not to quit in the climb to continue to move on. This could end up in one of the little uh, uh, troughs, yes, in our journey as we incline, and that does happen, but we've got to stay the stuff. And my, my observation over years of, uh, of teaching and watching and discipling and leading believers is this, this lack of steadfastness and perseverance when they face trials and difficulties, especially if they're large, that they begin, uh, and I think the devil's at work here, the enemy's at work, causing them to doubt the goodness and the power and the care of God in their journey. So we need steadfastness. Next is godliness. Godliness. It's about halfway up that mountain and the climb is really getting steep and really getting hard. We're facing all sorts of obstacles and it's really easy to quit at this point. But we, you say, be a godliness. We keep our focus. We keep our eyes on the summit. We keep our eyes on the goal, knowing that all things are not going to be the way that we want them, but knowing that our God is sovereign and controlled, that he cares and he has the power and he will be with us all the way up that mountain and we simply cannot quit. We must keep our eyes and our focus on who he is and what he can do in our journey. That's what he's saying here. And then godliness, okay? Then next, he says, add to godliness brotherly affection. It's the word philos or, or friendship love. Friendship love. I think what he's talking about here is we can't climb this mountain by ourselves. We just, we just simply can't. We need others in our lives. This is where the, the church and the community of faith and small groups, whether they're in person or online or Zoomed or whatever they are, it's just meeting with others, and, and, it's, and, it, and it's in the meeting of those friendship that discipleship takes place. Growth takes place. You might could say the discipleship in one way is just friendship with a spiritual perspective. That's all it is. And you can't get that 
alone. We cannot be our best self for God by ourselves. It's just simply not possible. And one of the great burdens that, that has been mine through, through the years, and I know it is your, of your leadership team as, as well, and it's not just looking for something for you to do. We know you can't climb this mountain separated, isolated, and alone. That's why we push the groups. That's why we encourage you to get them to encourage spiritual friendship so you can become all that God wants you to become. And then last is love. That's the summa bonum. That's what David was talking about in his prayer. That's the proof in the final pudding that you and I are growing in our Christ-likeness, that we can love anyone and everyone unconditionally and sacrificially. That's how he closes. And again, there's some sequence, but there's also some overlapping here with the goal being in Christ like this as well. And notice what he says in this final verse here. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they're growing, climbing the mountain, they will keep you from being ineffective, un unfruitful in your knowledge of the Lord. What's he saying? You want to count for Christ? You really want to count for Christ? Then do these things. Keep climbing the mountain. Keep climbing the mountain and moving forward. Amen? Amen. 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 Linda, come on up, baby. My sweet wife has a real gift of intercession and prayer is uh, going to come. And over the years, you've prayed for us through so much. And one of the last things that we wanted to do was have the joy and privilege of praying for you. So I want to ask you to stand with us. And Linda's going to lead us in a word of prayer. And then we'll be done. Keep on climbing, honey. Dear Father, we thank you so much for being such a great God, for resourcing us, Lord, that we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. And I pray, Father, for your people this morning who love you or they wouldn't be here, who have made a commitment to climb this mountain. Help them to renew that commitment. We get weary sometimes in well-doing, and it's been a wearisome year. And yet, Lord, may this be an opportunity to recommit ourselves and your people to recommit themselves to climbing this mountain, knowing, Lord Jesus, that you've given us all that we need. May we be in the Word. May we be people of the Word, not only knowing the Word, but doing the Word so that you may be glorified. And when we get discouraged and when we don't want to persevere anymore, may we know that your Holy Spirit is there living within us to spur us on and to give us the ability to take one more step towards Christ's likeness for the purpose, Father, of showing the world what great a love you have poured out and shed in our hearts, that we may shed it abroad in these times of trouble, that others need to know there is a peace and a joy to be had. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of being a part of this great church for so many years. And we look forward to the opportunities of more that you're going to do here. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.